Hello, everyone, and welcome to AISC's live webinar, Design of Reinforcement for Steel Members, presented today by Bo Dowswell. My name is Brent Liu. I am with AISC's Continuing Education Group, and I will be moderating today's presentation. I would like to introduce today's speaker, Bo Dowswell, PE, PhD, and Principal at ARC International. Bo Dowswell has been in the steel industry since 1985. The first nine years he spent as a detailer. He is the principal of ARC International, an engineering firm specializing in design and research solutions to complex problems for steel structures. He received his PhD in structural engineering for his research on gusset plates and is an adjunct professor at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He is a re registered professional engineer and has published several journal articles on steel connection design as well as steel beam stability. Bo is a member of the AISC Committee on Manuals, and he also serves on the AISC Committee on Industrial Buildings and Non-Building Structures. Very pleased to have you here today, Bo. I'm going to hand things over to you. Um, we've got two major topics that we're going to be talking about today, and most of the, the whole presentation is going to be on member strength and stability. We've got a couple of other miscellaneous topics thrown in here, too. But the two general topics are going to be column design and beam design. Now, once we get to those uh, two topics, we'll talk about some of the subtopics uh, under such, such as uh, uh, flexural buckling for the column design and AISC specification requirements and things like that. But we'll talk about that when we get there. One of the, the uh, things that I want to do up front, and I'll try and hurry through this pretty quickly. I think it's just three slides since we're already a little bit behind time. <clears throat> We've got uh, um, reasons for reinforcement. And, and what this is is, is uh, just some basic information uh, on why you would want to reinforce a structure. So, you know, the owner may come to you and say, I want to expand this building. And if you attach a new part of a, a structure to an existing part, you're obviously going to uh, add loads to the existing structure. And on the other side of the equation, you know, that, that pretty much talks about adding load to the structure. But on the other side of the equation, you have the member strength you have to worry about. So what if a, a member gets damaged, like if it gets hit by a truck or something like that, um, or if it uh, has corrosion problems or, or uh, uh, fatigue cracks, something like that, where you lose partial strength in the member. So that might be an opportunity to go in and, and uh, add some reinforcement. Now, let's talk about uh, different reinforcement schemes. The only thing we're going to be talking about today is member reinforcement. And what I mean by that is where you enlarge the cross-section to take any loads that, that are applied to that cross-section. And then there are, there are several. I mean, th this is just limited by uh, what we can come up with as engineers. Another one that's uh, 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 used fairly often is uh, to change the load path. For example, you may want to uh, add a beam or a column to take stress off of an overstressed member. All right, so now let's, let's get into the, the meat of our presentation. And the first thing we're going to talk about is column design. And remember, we're, we're mainly going to be focused on just the strength and the stability of these columns. So what I'm going to do first is start off with kind of a general design procedure. And this will kind of give us a, a road map on where we're headed. And if you see any, anything in these next two slides in this design procedure that's underlined, like I've got shown for reinforcement type up there, that just means that's a subtopic under column design that we're going to talk more about later. So number one under the, the design procedure is just to determine the reinforcement type. And uh, this may sound easy, but uh, you, know, you may have constraints um, uh, such as uh, maybe some obstructions that require you to reinforce uh, on one flange versus both flanges of your column. So that, that's the first step. And the second step is to estimate the reinforcement size. And that's, uh, you know, this is basically the same as what you would do with a, 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 a new building. 
it, it, when you start off with a new building, you have to estimate the beam and column size in that building. And this would be done much the same way. And, it, and it's done with uh, some preliminary calculations, possibly uh, engineering judgment. Uh, and, and, and if you're really not sure, the best thing to do is just uh, assume a size and go in and calculate it and do several iterations like you might do for a beam or a column in a new structure. All right, so once you get that estimated reinforcement size, you'll go on to number three. That's probably going to be the most time-consuming part of, of the calculation uh, when you calculate the, the properties of the reinforced cross-section, assuming uh, the reinforcement size that uh, you got from step number two. All right, step number four is determine the effect of geometric imperfections on flexural buckling. And what I'm talking about there, you know, it sounds uh, real complicated, but all that really is, I mean, it's not like you're going to go out and do a 50-page calculation and, and uh, you know, base the strength of your column on that. More than likely, especially if you have doubly symmetric reinforcement, it's going to be a matter of adding a couple of notes to your drawings. All right, let's move on to step five. And that's going to be to determine the effect of preload on the flexural buckling. In other words, in most cases, you're not going to be able to remove 100% of the load off of a column before you add the reinforcement. And in a lot of cases, uh, a lot of the things that I work on in power plants, you know, you've got some pretty heavy equipment that just absolutely cannot be removed without uh, shutting the plant down for months. Uh, which, of, of course, it might be more economical just to build a new unit for that plan in some cases rather than to unload the columns. All right, step six. Uh, let's talk about this when we get there. I would rather describe it with pictures, um, but step six is determine the effect of partial length reinforcement, and step seven is to check the strength and stability using the AIC specification requirements. And in our case, we're only going to be looking at flexural buckling. All right, in step number one, reinforcement type, um, what I'm going to do over the next couple of slides is just kind of point out a couple of disadvantages to singly symmetric reinforcement. And what I've got shown here is a wide flange column reinforced on one flange, and of course, Maybe you don't have access to this flange over here, so you can't get reinforcement on there. One of the disadvantages is, is that your original axial load is going to be assumed at the centroid of the non-reinforced member. And when you reinforce it, that centroid is going to shift toward the reinforcement. So it's going to be over here somewhere. So you've got an eccentricity. That's going to cause a moment in your column where you're going to have to, in addition to the axial load, design for that moment. So you would go to AIC Chapter H, uh, calculate the axial strength, the flexural strength, and then do the combination per Chapter H. There's another disadvantage of singly symmetric reinforcement is well shrinkage. If you have singly symmetric reinforcement, you're going to get a, a, a deformation that bows away from the reinforcement location like I've got shown in the picture. And if you have doubly symmetric reinforcement, the guys in the field, the, the, the field welders, at least have a chance to, to uh, reduce that distortion because they're, you're going to get shrinkage from both flanges. And usually they can come up with uh, uh, weld procedures and weld shrinkage, uh, uh, weld procedures and weld sequences that can minimize the distortion and hopefully keep the column within the code of standard practice allowables, which is L over 1,000. OK, so here's what we're going to be talking about for most of the section on columns, and that's doubly symmetric reinforcement. And the one on the left there is really the, the probably the most uh, common type of reinforcement for columns. And the one on the right can be used to, it gives you a good bit of uh, uh, stiffness in the weak axis direction. At least uh, sometimes it can change the weak axis to the strong axis. In fact, by the time you have the plates on the flange tips like that. 
All right, so I assume everybody is familiar with the AISC specification on flexural buckling. So let's shift gears and, and uh, go through two slides to kind of review the flexural buckling provisions in Section A3. And uh, I'll, I'll skim through this pretty fast because we're behind time a little bit. Your, your critical stress is going to be calculated based on one of these two equations. The bottom one is for elastic buckling. It's just 87.7% of the oiler stress. And the top one is for inelastic buckling. And there's your, your uh, F sub B, which is the oiler buckling stress. All right, one of the very important things we need to consider, not necessarily do 50 pages of counts on, but we need to consider, is geometric imperfections. And there are really three sources that I came up with, other than, say, if you have a damaged column. You have the top one up here, you have to deal with in all buildings. Even, the, even a new building, you've got rolling fabrication and erection tolerances. The second one, is going to be P delta deformations. And this is something that most people don't really think too much about. But if you have a column that's in place and it has a preload on there, which is a load that is on the column before reinforcement is added, then you're going to have uh, a P delta deformation. And what you can do is, is you can either go to Chapter C in the 2010 AISC specification, or if you want to do the uh, uh, the B1 amplification factors to get that P delta, you can go to Appendix 8. Now for the third one here, this is really the only one that we, there's no way to know before we size the reinforcement how big it is. The other two we can kind of, I mean if we have to, we can go out and measure. But uh, this third one is the welding distortion. So to get the total distortion, I'm going to use this later. So remember the terminology, delta sub D is the total deformation um, the total out of straightness of the column after welding has occurred. So it's going to be the sum of all three of these, including the weld distortion. Okay, so th this slide pretty much tells you why the initial deformation in a column is important. And what I have on the vertical axis is the axial load in a column on the horizontal axis, I have delta, which is going to be the out of the, the horizontal out of plane deformation of this column at the mid height. All right, so let's take a look at the the solid line on the top here, and what that is is that, that's for a column with a, a an initial deformation in it of 0.16 inches, which for I believe is based on a 13 foot long column, which is right at the limit for the code of standard practice. So we'll say that one is within the code of standard practice barely. And you can see how it behaves. This is, this is all elastic. It doesn't include inelastic effects, but the, the same curve generally applies. The, the, the behavior goes up to about this point, then it starts becoming nonlinear. And then it, uh, not long after that, you have more load and it becomes unstable. All right, so let's take a look. Let's say that you have a, a really uh, singly symmetric reinforcement with a big weld on there, and you get a, a three times the amount of deformation, which bumps us up to 0.48 inches. So 0.48 is where we're going to start over here on the horizontal axis, and then we're going to go up, and it looks like it, it almost uh, starts to curve immediately, and, but you, I guess you could say that's, uh, uh, it kind of starts to become unstable somewhere in this area uh, where we, uh, called the knee of the curve. All right, so you can see the effect of the out-of-plane uh, initial deformations in the column. And this third one is put in there just for fun. That, that would be for a damaged column that's out of straight 1.2 inches before load is applied. And that's for the dashed red curve on the bottom. OK, so now we know how important this is. But what if we have a column that we have that we know is is uh, is not within the AISC code of standard practice tolerances, which is L over a thousand. That's down here on the bottom. I'll call it delta sub O. All right. So let's say that delta sub D after welding is greater than delta sub O. 
well, how do you, how do you check to see if that column is okay? And here's a way that uh, that you can do it. And I'm I'm going to go back to the beam column approach. And what you do is you take the axial load that's in the column and combine that with a moment. And the first order moment is going to be p sub r, which is the required axial load in the column, times the difference between delta sub d and delta sub o. All right, so that's the first order moment in the column. And you would combine that with the axial load in the column and go to chapter H in the AISC specification to design as a beam column. All right, so, but don't forget, we need to, we need to multiply that in. There's our n from the, that we just calculated. We need to amplify that for the second order effects for B1 to get m required, which is the required moment that we need to go in to chapter uh, uh, C with, uh, or chapter H with, I'm sorry, for the beam column chapter. So here's the, the equation for B1. Uh, it's just uh, uh, C sub m is going to be 1 in this case, and P sub r is the required axial load in the column, and P sub E1 is the Euler buckling load of the column. It's the elastic buckling load given by this equation. OK, so now we know how to take account of the geometric imperfections if we're, if we're out of tolerance. but uh, we haven't talked about how to calculate a well distortion yet. So let's see what we can do on this next slide. And um, this is a very good reference for anybody that doesn't have it. Make sure you get it. That, that book is, uh, is even older than I am. Uh, so uh, a lot of the young guys out there may not think that it's, uh, it's worth getting that one, but it's a great reference, if nothing else, just for the general logic behind the problem solving in it. OK, so here's the equation straight out of Blodgett. And it's a, a good, simple, nice equation. And it's pretty accurate, too. And what we have is A, that's the total area of the welds. Most of the time, you're going to have one on each side of the flange, like I've got shown in the picture there. So you multiply the, the weld area on one side times two, obviously, to get the total area. And our value Y here is going to be the centroid of the distance between the centroid of the welds to the centroid of the built up cross section. And usually, it's a tiny bit conservative just to go to the bottom flange of the beam there in that case. And L, that's just the length of the member. But let's not forget when we're, we're using this that that's going to be the length of the member assuming that the, the reinforcement is full length. So that's going to be the length of the, the beam, uh, of the column, the weld, and the reinforcement. OK, and our, our I here, that's just going to be the moment of inertia of the built-up cross-section. Just a real quick note on this. I don't want to spend too much time. Here's the same equation from Blodgett. Let's take a look at A. For two welds, that's going to be the weld size squared. All right, so not only for economics, but for welding distortion, you want to try to minimize uh, the welding distortion. So, and being that that's based on the weld leg size squared, um, you know, you go from a 3 16th fillet weld, which may give you a 1 8 distortion for a member and possibly be within the AISC tolerances in the code of standard practice. Well, you, you double the size, then all of a sudden your distortion is going to be four times. So, you may end up with a half inch distortion, which is definitely not going to be within the code of standard practice unless you have a really long member. OK, now here's one way to um, calculate the welding distortion if you have partial length reinforcement. You know, I, I showed you the uh, Blodgett equation is based on full length reinforcement. So what we can do is just treat the, the beam as if it's um, the length of the reinforcement, like I've got shown there. In other words, you're going to say this is L, the distance from end to end of the reinforcement. And then the part on the end here, you can treat this part as just a, a rigid straight link. And then, of course, you can just use trig after that to, to get the distance between uh, the beam and, and the, the where delta sub w that we just calculated starts. 
So you can kind of figure that out based on trig. And one more thing about this, stitch welding is obviously going to help to uh, uh, decrease your, your welding, which is going to speed up the job. It's going to uh, uh, require less time to weld. It's going to be more economical, and it's going to cause less distortion. And here's a way to predict the distortion in a stitch weld. We take our weld we calculate with Blodgett's equation, multiply that by our reduction factor, R sub S, and we come up with the, the new delta sub W. So R sub S is real simple. It's just L over P, and uh, L is the length of the stitch weld, and P is the distance between the center of the stitch welds. Uh, an unrelated topic, I, I wanted to put this in there. I've got references, uh, three slides worth of references at the end of the presentation for you. We won't go over it, but uh, it's there for you to look at. Uh, if you have a, a, a member that's under load, either a beam uh, under a moment uh, at the time of reinforcement, a moment preload, or a column that's under an axial preload when you add the reinforcement, this reference gives you a lot of good uh, equations, practical equations on how to predict that. So I would suggest you, uh, you check into that reference. OK, now here's one of the good things about geometric imperfections. A lot of times you really don't have to, to do too many calcs to uh, uh, own geometric imperfections. A lot of times it just comes down to adding a couple of notes to the drawings. And especially if you've got doubly symmetric reinforcement, usually you can uh, put this drawing note number one that I've got up here. That's, that's roughly what I always put on my drawings. It says welding shall be performed using techniques and sequences that minimize distortion. So to be able to do that, you have to at least be able to estimate how much distortion is in there. So if, you're, if you've got doubly symmetric reinforcement, the way I do this, uh, referring to this second bullet point down here, is I, just, I put a note on saying that uh, the, the AISC code of standard practice has to be met for the columns in the post-welded condition. In other words, after welding, all the welding distortion and the other two that we talked about, everything added together has to be, the column still has to be within the code of standard practice requirements. All right, so I feel comfortable that they can do that for doubly symmetric reinforcement, but for singly symmetric reinforcement, uh, you may want to try to come up with something else. Bo, are you still there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay, let's uh, let's move on to partial length reinforcement, and uh, this is this is going to be um, uh, a topic that that uh, we, we've got some really good practical design guidance for. And what I'm talking about here, let's just for example take this cross section with the flange plates welded to the column. And of course, as you see in the picture over here, you can't really run the reinforcement down all the way to where we've probably assumed in our structural analysis model, which is the intersection of the beam and the column. So we have this uh, uh, section in here that's left unreinforced where we have our beams. And of course, that's not going to cause too much of a problem for us because that beam probably braces the column at, that, at the top and bottom or near the top and bottom anyway. But what if you ran into a case like this? Um, over on the right-hand side, where you have to pull your reinforcement back uh, all the way down here, where you might end up with 50% of your column covered with the reinforcing plates. And uh, I'll show you how to account for that with a step column approach uh, coming up. But uh, one thing about this, usually, if I can get by with it, I'll, I'll just make these this reinforcement plate the same as this reinforcement plate, and just leave this gap up here if, if, if we don't, I don't have a gusset plate up there. And one reason for that is obviously economics. You, you've got two of the same plate and two of the same welds. Uh, but also, let's also think about uh, welding distortion. You don't want to have a lot of welding distortion in that, 
uh, if you will, on one side here, this, this column may kick over a little bit, uh, which uh, you really don't want that. Now on this next slide, what I'm going to talk about, um, so I don't have to come back to this one, is going to be, let's take that out. It's going to, we're, we're going to talk about what happens um, if you're overstressed in this area. And I'll do that in the example coming up too, but you may want to add some supplemental reinforcement um, starting up here. You need a development length in there uh, all the way to this unreinforced part of the, uh, the, the column here. So in other words, in, in this range right here for this column with some development length in there, you would want to run it past uh, so you can develop that plate. So on the next slide, here, here's what's done sometimes. Let's take a look at the picture up here. Uh, if you've got obstructions on the flange up here, you can always kind of, uh, uh, you know, stop your reinforcement short and add these tab plates on there. Sometimes they're called wing plates, and I've heard them called several different things. Um, but the most economical one of these, you know, the one on the top there, it has to be either partial pin welded or full pin welded. So really the most economical way to do this is just shift that plate over like I've got shown in this bottom picture. Uh, give, you know, you may want to shift it over half an inch to give them enough shift, shelf to get a fillet weld in there, and then you can put stitch fillet welds for this reinforcement. But hopefully, we'll be able to use this step column approach I'm going to show you, and be able to avoid that type of reinforcement altogether. Uh, I, I rarely use that uh, reinforcement like I just showed you those tab plates. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to take this column on the left-hand side and model that as a stepped column like I've got shown on the right-hand picture. And the way we're going to do it is not to go through and do a bunch of theoretical calculations that take all day to design a stepped column. There's this reference that's over 40 years old. Take a look in your, uh, those last three slides I've got up there for you. It's an AISC journal paper. And it gives you a giant table of, of different ratios of moment of inertias and lengths. And it gives you a couple of K factors, effective length factors that we'll talk about. Uh, I'll blow up part of this table for you here in just a minute so we can see what's in there. So let's talk about what we need to go into that table first. Um, well, this slide talks about what we're going to get out of the table, actually. There's going to be an effective length factor. We've got K sub S1. That's going to be if we have reinforcement pulled back at one end. And K sub S2 is if we have reinforcement pulled back at two ends. So there's going to be two different columns in the table that we can pull numbers out of. The number is going to be greater than one. The effective length factor is always going to be greater than one. So what that implies is, is um, uh, we're going to be using the reinforced member properties which are here and here. Uh, so don't, don't uh, just remember that, because we're not going to go in with our non-reinforced member properties, because in that case, k would be equal to uh, less than 1. So just remember, you have to remember which properties to use with this effective length factor. To go into the table, we need the moment of inertia ratio. All it is, I sub, I sub 0 is the, the non-reinforced moment of inertia. So you calculate that here and here. That, that's the, um, the original cross-sectional properties. I sub R is the reinforced cross-sectional moment of inertia. Now don't forget, this has to be calculated about the axis of buckling. So if you want to check both strong and weak axis, you need to do two counts for, the, for uh, this ratio. OK, to go into the table, we also need the length ratio. L sub R is always going to be the reinforcement length. In this case, uh, it's just uh, it, the uh, distance uh, from the bottom of the column to the, uh, where the reinforcement is cut off. And here is uh, simply the reinforcement length. So let's take a look at this top right-hand corner that I've got in red there. Pull that out. So that's what we're looking at right here. It's for a moment of inertia ratio of 2.5. Reinforced 
moment of inertia divided by original. And that's pretty big. That, that 2.5 ratio is pretty big. Uh, normally you're going to be anywhere from say 1.5 to all the way up to around 2 or so normally. So, uh, so just keep that in mind that these values in here are a little bit different than you'll normally see. Um, let's say we've got a, a, a length ratio where you're covering 50% of the column with the reinforcing. All right, so you come over here. Let's say you're, you're going to pull your reinforcement back on two ends of the column. So you go into the K sub S2 column and pull out a, an effective length factor of 1.14. All right, so that's a pretty significant number because remember, for elastic columns, this is going to get squared. So it's going to be a, a pretty big reduction in your column stream. But take a look at this. The reason I put this conservative value of 2.5 up here is because I think we can always say, unless you have a really strange situation where your moment of inertia ratio is thrown way out, that uh, anything above a 90%, you can have a gap in there just so long as it's, uh, you know, it doesn't get above, say, this value for the, the K sub S2 or here for the K sub S1. So you can pull your, your uh, reinforcement back a little bit and, and not worry about it because those numbers are going to be negligible even after we square it. Okay, now that we know the, a little bit about the partial length reinforcement, we're going to do an example on that at the end of the column section. But let's talk about preload. I know this is kind of a hot topic. Uh, and of course, that's the initial load in the column at the time of reinforcement. And we have two cases. Now, what, what I'm going to show you is this is the way I do it. Uh, there, there's a lot of research out there that, that says don't worry about preloading columns. And I've got that reinforcement, uh, 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 column reinforcement research for you listed. We're not going to have time to, to go over it in detail, but I'll at least show it to you. So there, there are really two cases that I use, what I call stabilizing reinforcement and non-stabilizing reinforcement. So if you look at all the research that's been done, it's been done with what I'm calling stabilizing reinforcement. Uh, so you don't have to worry about the preload. Uh, as far as I know, there has, has been no research on columns with preload in it with non-stabilizing reinforcement. So let's talk about what is stabilizing reinforcement. And here's the definition right here. R sub R has got to be greater than or equal to 85% of R sub O. R sub O is just the radius of gyration for the axis of buckling, if you're concerned uh, if you're not sure which axis it's going to be, you need to check both um, for the original cross section. R sub R is the same thing, but it's for the reinforced cross section. All right, so it's as simple as that. Just make your check. And in most cases, in fact, every case that I've used that I can remember over the past five years, I have been able to use stabilizing reinforcement. Okay, so this is kind of an, an analogy of the stabilizing reinforcement concept. And if, if you're uh, familiar with, with buckling your strain braces, in fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure this picture came from an AIC webinar from, from a while back. Um, but but uh, uh, so you may want to uh, check that out if you're not uh, familiar with the buckling your strain braces. But uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick uh, rundown of it. What we have is this core section of the buckling or strain brace, and that's designed to yield in tension and compression. And it can yield in compression because we've got this outer casing uh, that restrains the buckling in compression. All right? So you put the axial load and compression on there, and it's not going to buckle because of the, you've got the restraining effect of that outer casing on there. And what I'm trying to say is that the stabilizing reinforcement does the same thing. You have uh, uh, up here, you're, you're, uh, we're saying that this inner core is going to be, that's the initial column. That's, say, at W14 at 90 that you're going to reinforce. And then this outer 
uh, casing, that's going to be your your uh, uh, the stabilizing stabilizing effect is going to come from the uh, uh, the new reinforcement you've added. And uh, one one reason we can say that is because you know even if this has uh, uh, sixty percent say of the of the buckling load on the initial column at the time of reinforcement, well it it, it may end up yielding, but the reinforcement is going to have less stress in there, uh, at least in those stages, and it's going to restrain the buckling even if the inner core, the original cross section, is yielded. Okay, now this is really um, something that I don't like to use very much. What if, what if your um, reinforcement is not going to be able to be classified as as stabilizing reinforcement. Uh, if your radius of gyration of the reinforced member is less than 85% of the radius of gyration of the original member. Well, what we can do is just kind of go back. We're, we're stepping back in time. We're, we're going back to the, the Green Book, uh, the 89 uh, uh, manual, and doing an allowable stress approach. And I know this is what most people use nowadays for, for uh, all columns, but uh, if you look at the test results, it's extremely conservative if you do have stabilizing reinforcement as I've defined it. And that, that slide, I'm not going to go through and read everything on the previous slide because it's all described with pictures here. Uh, for non-stabilizing reinforcement, we, we've got this uh, original column with a preload on there, P sub O. And uh, you can calculate sigma sub O with our equation over here, just P over A. But now we go in, and we're going to add these two reinforcing plates on there. And then we're going to, in addition to the P sub O, we're going to add a P sub 1 to it. All right, but now we have this A sub R, the area of the reinforced cross section. So what we end up with, we can calculate sigma sub R, which is the reinforcing stress, like I've got labeled over here, you can see that it's going to be a good bit smaller. And for the initial member, for the core member, uh, the original column, we're going to have this. We're going to have to add sigma sub r plus sigma sub o. And then the, the problem comes in is what do you compare that to? Um, most people uh, that I've worked with uh, would compare that to uh, uh, the lateral buckling strength of the, of the uh, reinforced column. All right, like I said, I'm not going to spend much time on this. This is kind of there for for you to go over later. This is the experimental results. And one thing to remember, I'll go ahead and I'm not going to go through all the details, but one thing to remember, once we get uh, to this third slide that talks about the experiment, the, the experimental results, this, and this, this is true. I've got two more coming up in the beam section, but this is true of all the experimental results results that I present in this presentation. Take a look at that far right-hand column, and that gives you a, a, a ratio. It's going to be the test load divided by the nominal strength. Anything bigger than one is going to be conservative. All right, and, and all these numbers in this right-hand column are calculated on members with stabilizing reinforcement, neglecting the preload, and the preload values you can see are pretty high you know, up to close to 100 kips preload in that column before the reinforcement was added. Okay, the, uh, just real briefly on this slide. At the University of Alberta, they did an extensive study on, on preloaded members, and uh, their conclusion was neglect the preload for all column design. But if you look in the research, uh, sometimes you need to check it out. Uh, um, the reinforcement was all considered uh, stabilizing reinforcement for everything that they, that they uh, for all 317 finite element models that they ran.
Okay, so now that we've, we've talked about uh, what can affect the lateral buckling strength of a column, let's go ahead and go through an example. And, and this will cover everything, the step, the preload, the stepped approach, and uh, some, some other things, one or two other things we didn't discuss. So what we're going to have is a 14 at 90, 18 feet long. The yield strength is 50 KSI. I've assumed that for the plate and the column. The preload is 300 kits. The final total axial load is 1,100 kits. Now, these are factored loads. We're going to use LRFD for this problem. One thing to note, because this is the total factored load, the 1,100, that's going to be uh, the preload plus an additional 800 kits is going to give you that 1,100. So that includes the preload. All right, the first step, remember, is, is uh, determine what type of reinforcement. And, uh, and I just, uh, we're going to do it based on this picture down here. And to determine the, the size, I'm just coming, I just came up with a three-quarter by 12 plate. Once we get to the end, we'll see that that could be reduced. I probably would have gone with a half inch by 10 in the end. But, uh, you know, that requires a couple of iterations to do that. So I'm just showing you the first iteration here. Next up, I've given you the section properties. The area of the reinforced cross-section is 44.5. Moment of inertia, that's for the y-axis of the reinforced section, 578, and radius of gyration for the y-axis is 3.6. Alright, we're only going to look at the y-axis because the x and the y are both uh, the same length. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the step column approach because what we found out is that there's some obstructions up here or uh, maybe we just decided to cut the reinforcement back four feet on each end for economical reasons and to eliminate uh, or, or to cut down on distortion. All right, the first thing I'm going to do is check for stabilizing reinforcement. All right, we've got our 14 at 90. The radius of gyration of the original cross-section in the y-axis is, is 3.7. All right, so we plug that in down here, multiply by 0.85, and then you compare that to what we calculated uh, for the reinforced section. So we see that we're going to uh, have stabilizing reinforcement. Therefore, the 300 kit preload, we're, we're basically going to neglect that at this point because uh, that's added. Don't, don't forget to add it in, of course. Uh, you know, we have to account for it, but we're, we're uh, going to neglect it in the column design. <clears throat> Okay, so next up, what we're going to do is um, do the step column approach because we pulled our reinforcement back four feet on each end. So we need the moment of inertia of the W14 at 90. That's straight out of the manual, 362 uh, inches to the fourth in the y-axis direction. So we calculate our ratio here, reinforced divided by the original cross-section, moment of inertia is 1.6. That's about where you would normally expect it to be. To go into the table, we need to know the length ratio. All right, that's going to be here. We've, we've got uh, uh, our reinforcement length, is, remember, is 18 feet. That's the total column length minus 4 feet on each end gives us 10 feet. So we've only got 55.6% of our column covered with reinforcement. And even at that, with that uh, relatively low moment of inertia ratio, we go into the tables uh, from that from that. Uh, journal paper that I've got in the references and pull out a K factor of 1.04. So it's not going to be a huge hit on us, even though that's, uh, that number is going to be squared. Or uh, In our case, we're in the inelastic range, so it's not quite going to be squared, but it will increase. So all we have to do now is calculate the slurrence ratio, plug the 1.04 times the 18 feet column length, uh, convert to inches and divide by the radius of gyration of the built-up cross-section. Remember, that's, that's uh, R of the built-up cross-section. So we end up with 62.4, and just plug that in down here to come up with the S of B, which is 73.5 KSI. Remember, that's going to be our elastic 
uh, kind of our older buffering stress, and that's greater than 44% of the yield. So we're going to use the inelastic column buffering equation out of the spec, and that's going to give us 37.6 KSI. So really, you know, we're, we're uh, all, all we have to do is plug in now. This is the area of the reinforced column times that 37.6, and then multiply by our p factor. So we have a, a strength, a, a design strength of 1,500 kips, and that's greater than 1,100, which is the total applied load, including the preload. So we're good. But let's not forget this. We need to go back and check, because we pulled that reinforcement back, we need to go back and check the original W14 by 90 to make sure that it's not going to yield. So what we do, we just go into the manual, pull out the area, straight out of the, the manual tables, 26.5 inches squared, and then calculate uh, the yield strength, including the D factor there. And it's 1,190 kips, and that's greater than the applied load. So we really don't need these uh, ear plates on the column, which is good because they uh, add to distortion and cost and schedule. Okay, Brent, do we have any questions? All right, Bo. Yeah, there's a couple of questions I'd like you to address before we move on to beams. Um, one question is this. Um, if the cross se section you're dealing with is corroded, would you still follow the same process that you laid out? Well, that's a good question, and I've actually been looking into the how to handle this corrosion a good bit lately. And uh, there, there's what you would have to do in to be to use this procedure is to assume that the corrosion is is the same over the cross section. In other words, uh, if you've got a corroded flange. Uh, you would assume that the that the corrosion is is uh, uniform across that flange, and just assume a thinner flange. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, you'd have to come up with a way to do it. If you have a corrosion, say, that's limited to one half of one of the flanges, you could design. I mean, it, it maybe halfway through or something like that. You know, I would just go back to a, a, a theoretical approach and assume that it's a singly symmetric or or uh, an unsymmetric member, whatever the case is, and designed per the AISC spec for that with whatever the remaining thickness is. Okay. And then real quick, I'm going to go back to slide 42. And uh, a couple people are just asking for just clarification once again, This the, the definition of Preload. What, 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 can you expand on that a little bit? Okay, yes, preload. Yeah, that, that is just the load in the column that's there at the time of reinforcement. In other words, I work on a lot of uh, uh, power plant type projects, a lot of industrial structures, and a lot of times it's, it's just not feasible or almost impossible to remove 100% of the load off of the member before you add this reinforcement. So you, you end up with uh, all this uh, you know, heavy equipment that cannot uh, practically cannot be removed. Uh, so there may be uh, you know, a 70 kip load in your column while you're welding this reinforcement on. OK, thank you. All right, let's move on to the beam section. I'll take us back to slide 61. OK, so when we talk about beams, we're, we're going to go through the same uh, uh, types of things we talked about for columns. You know, we're going to talk about the preload. But in this case, it's going to be a moment instead of an axial load. We're going to talk about the reinforcement types and, and the, the effect of, of having partial length reinforcement and such. And the general design procedure is really similar, but I'll, we'll go ahead and go through it again. Um, 
because there are a couple of differences in here. Uh, step one and two are the same, uh, and, and three also. But uh, one thing about, uh, uh, you know, after you determine the reinforcement type and the reinforcement size, you're going to have a lot of time spent in step three for beams. And the reason is because for lateral torsional buffling, you have more variables you need other than just the area, moment of inertia, and radius of gyration. Now you've got warping factors and, and, and uh, torsional factors, J, and some things like that. Not only that, but you're, you're in most cases for beams, you're going to be having a, uh, uh, or a singly symmetric uh, member in most cases for the beams, which makes it a lot harder to calculate those section properties. So the best thing to do in step three is figure out how to set a spreadsheet up, probably. Step four is a little different. This is where it, gets, it changes up a little bit. Uh, the first thing we need to know there, obviously, is uh, the same for a regular, uh, a, a brand new beam, and that's to determine if the, the compression flange is braced laterally. And if you uh, find out that it's braced laterally, then step five and six on the next slide are uh, not required because step five is, is to determine the effect of the preload on lateral torsion buffling. And step six talks about lateral, uh, uh, the partial length reinforcement effect on lateral torsion buffling. So we'll talk more about the preload and the partial length reinforcement here in just a minute. Next up, you would go to the AISC specification, check strength and stability, and, and then don't forget serviceability. Well, for serviceability, you know, you've got all your normal things, mainly deflection and then maybe some vibration that you might want to check. But also don't forget, uh, I, I keep saying that the, talking about the welding distortion, but what if you have a, a, a half inch of welding distortion in the upward direction on a beam um, and, it, and it causes uh, maybe a crack in, your, in a floor? Or something like that. So just, you know, I'm, all I'm saying is, is, is uh, just make sure that you, you at least think about some of these items that we've gone through. All right, so let's talk about reinforcement types. Plate at the bottom flange. This is my favorite type of reinforcement. A plate here, nothing on the top flange. And this is my favorite reinforcement for a few reasons, because it can be clamped in place in the field for relatively easy fit up. And then you can weld in the down hand position. Usually you'll make your plate wider than the bottom flange. And the reason is so you can get a down hand weld. You'll want to have enough for a, shell, a weld shelf plus a little bit of tolerances there. Usually I'll go for at least three quarter and that allows them to move from side to side just a little bit, three quarters of an inch between the flange tip and the edge of the plate there. And one advantage, usually it's an advantage, it can be a disadvantage like we just talked about, is camber due to well shrinkage is upward for this type of, of uh, reinforcement. Well, if you need more strength, obviously you can take that bottom flange reinforcement and add something to the top. The problem comes in is that at least in most commercial buildings and some industrial buildings might have grading up there on the top flange. Uh, that's going to obstruct uh, where you uh, can't do this. You know, I mean, and one thing I'll mention too is for the columns and beams, obviously this is just limited by our imagination. We can do whatever we want, whatever is most economical and whatever is uh, uh, best for the, the owner and the engineer. So, I mean, you can add a, an angle in here or, or uh, I've seen people that add uh, bars in here uh, and, and just weld those in. So you can do whatever you want. I'm just kind of showing you, just giving you some general ideas. Now what about this one? This one is, uh, I guess I would call it fairly common. Uh, what if you don't have access to the top flange, but you need more than what a plate is going to give you on the bottom flange, either more stiffness or strength, or this isn't going to help your lateral torsional buffering capacity out that much based on how it's up then. But uh, you definitely could get more stiffness and strength out of it. What we have is WT welded to the bottom flange. Now this is going to be a lot more expensive because your overhead welding is about four times as uh, four times one fourth of the production as a downhand weld. 
So that, the welding is going to cost you a lot more. The fit up is not going to be as easy because it's it's not as easy to just to hold up there like the plate is with a clamp. And another thing that's going to cost money and other problems that we'll talk about is you either have to run it full length and attach to the supporting member or if you run partial length reinforcement, sometimes you may be worried, you know, that that, that uh, key may want to move sideways. Um, Maybe may, may want to uh, uh, move laterally. Uh, so we need to kind of stabilize that flange of that key with a, a stabilizer plate on the end like I've got shown there. Now, of course, that adds to the cost, but the main thing that I would be worried about here, I've got a weld shown there, is the, the heat due to welding and how does that affect the strength of the beam. Now, when, you have, when, you're, when you're making this weld for the T uh, up in, in this area, uh, you're going to get a reduction due to the welding heat on this bottom flange of the beam. The way I do it is, is through an effective width type method, and uh, the welding heat due to that longitudinal weld on the left-hand picture is not going to be, uh, it's not going to reduce the strength quite as much as the one on the right-hand picture. In fact, uh, the one on the right-hand, most of the time, is going to cause the whole bottom flange to be ineffective due to the welding heat. The one over here on the left-hand side doesn't take out, uh, you know, uh, near as much as welding perpendicular to the flange. So just watch out for that. All right, here's a couple of more that are uh, uh, that we can talk about. If you have weak axis bending, obviously the one on the left is a good option. But what if you have weak axis bending due to a crane beam that's on the top? Uh, a crane rail that's on the top uh, where all the loads coming into the top flange, this may be a good option with the channel cap there. Problem is uh, with that one, let's go back. The problem is that obviously you have to move the crane rail, but a lot of times you're going to, if you're increasing the capacity of the, the crane, you're going to have to replace that rail sometimes too. Uh, another way to do it that I've seen is just weld angles on the tip of the flange. I don't have a picture for that one, though. For torsion, anything with a closed section increases the torsional strength and stiffness. And this one over here is partially closed. Lateral torsional buckling. All you're looking for here is uh, if you have lateral torsional buckling problems, uh, you either want to provide uh, torsional stiffness or lateral stiffness of the compression flange or uh, a little bit of both, like I've got shown on the right picture over there. So let's talk a little bit about the AISC specification requirements for beams. And this is something we're, we're really not going to go through in great detail, but I mainly wanted to show you some of the the different variables, because we're going to talk about those once we get into the partial length reinforcement uh, and the preload. So what we end up with, unfortunately, section F2 that we're all familiar with is only for doubly symmetric I sections. We need to go to section F4 of the AISC spec for singly symmetric I shapes, and it it, it uh, gives you the equations for singly symmetric I-shaped members, but it also throws in uh, something else that requires further work from us, and that's uh, uh, web local buckling, which we're really not going to be concerned about in most cases for uh, reinforced beams, but um, uh, if you re reinforce a plate girder, that could come in handy, but really it just kind of adds to our work. Uh, when we're talking about reinforced beams. Okay, so it looks like uh, uh, for me, uh, personally, I consider that I-shaped, and I consider that I-shaped. So let's really quick, uh, this is really close to what Section F2 uh, says, so we'll kind of go through it really quick. Our L sub P is going to be defined 
the definition is the same as for F2, as the limiting embrace length for yielding. And really the, the thing we need to know is that R sub T is defined as the radius of gyration of the compression flange plus one third of the web. All right, and just like in section F2 of the spec, we have this equation for L sub R, and it's real similar, uh, but we've got this L sub L, I think, is the only difference instead of uh, the 0.7 FY, which is in F2. Uh, but what we're going to talk about on the next slide is going to be what is S sub L, uh, and then we'll, we'll need to know what H sub O is because we, we talk about that later, and then we'll talk a little bit about J, uh, which is... Uh, the torsion constant. So F sub L is the magnitude of the flexural stress in the compression flange of the beam at which lateral torsional buckling is influenced by yielding. And if you look at this, if this is your uh, ratio of the section modulus reference to the tension flange divided by that reference to the compression flange, if that's greater than 0.7, greater than or equal to, then our S of L is 0.7 times the yield strength. And that's the same, it's a little bit different form, but that's the same as what we have in section F2. All that is, is it assumes a residual stress in compression at the outer tips of, of our beam flange of 30% of the yield stress. So we end up with a, 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 usable, yield, a, a usable stress S sub L of 70% of the yield stress because we, we're neglecting or we're saying we can't use the 30% because of the residual stresses. All right, so we've got a different value here once, we, once we're below this 0.7 uh, value, and it's going to be less than 0.7. This ratio is going to be less than 0.7 when you're in this range. So we might get down to uh, 0.5 or 0.6 times the yield stress. So that's going to lower our strength a little bit. For H sub O, that's just the distance between the flange centroids, and we're going to talk about that more once we get into the T reinforcement. Here's one thing to, to remember about this section F4, is that J is a torsion constant, the St. Benant torsion constant. Don't forget that for this ratio, the moment of inertia ratio, less than or equal to 0.23, J should be taken as zero. Now the reason for that is for thin web members, you can get a, a, a I don't want to say a, a really large reduction, but you can get a significant reduction in the lateral torsional buckling strength due to the flexibility of the web, uh, otherwise known as distortional buckling. So, so your lateral torsional buckling strength is less than what you think it is if you have a real flexible web. This um, doesn't really, uh, uh, may not apply to uh, sections with thick webs like we're mainly going to be dealing with, but uh, until we get some research on this, uh, I, I, I just stick with what the code says. Now, this moment of inertia ratio is just the weak axis moment of inertia of the built-up section divided by the weak axis moment of, well, I should say the y-axis moment of inertia of the compression flange because it's the weak axis of the member but the strong axis of the flange. So now we'll just go through, and this is going to be analogous to section F2. We've got three, three different ranges of behavior for lateral torsional buckling or, or for the bending strength of a beam. Um, the first one is going to be for when your embrace length is less than or equal to L sub P. And in that case, you get no lateral torsional buckling. And you'll use this equation, which has this R sub PC. That's a web classification factor that we'll talk about, uh, times M sub YC, which is the yield uh, moment in the compression flange. And you can see this is just another form, F sub Y times the section modules at the compression flange. So the web classification factor 
Um, I haven't covered in this presentation anything for non-compact webs. Uh, if you if you have that situation, you'll have to go to section F4 and, and look at the equations. But for compact webs, which is mostly what we're going to be worried about, uh, you have this moment of inertia ratio, which is the same as what we had up there before. Uh, if it's greater than 0.23, here's our R sub PC. So what you end up with is just the plastic moment capacity of the cross section when you plug this back into the equation on the last slide. And uh, when the moment of inertia ratio is less than or equal to 0.23, the value is 1. So in the intermediate length range, we're going to have inelastic buckling. And it's given by this equation. We've got everything to find in there. And it's really analogous except for this R sub P C factor to what we have in the, the uh, section F2 that we all know how to do already. All right, so C sub B, we know what that is. Um, it's just the lateral torsion of buckling modification factor based on the shape of the moment diagram. All right, for elastic buckling, the embrace length is greater than L sub R. And we're going to end up with this equation that's similar to what we would have in section F2. But now we're talking about the critical stress times the section modules at the compression flange. And then that's got to be less than or equal to this value that we calculated for when L sub B is less than L sub P. So we've, we've defined everything in the critical stress equation before, so we don't need to spend any more time on that. All right, so now we've, we've kind of gone really fast through lateral torsional buckling. But I want to do these next two slides. Uh, I wanted to have these up here just to remind us, don't forget to check tension flange yielding. Obviously, when your section module's reference to the tension flange is greater than that at the compression flange, you don't have to worry about it. It says so explicitly in the spec, too. But if not, then here's what you need to do. Uh, once again, I've only got for compact webs. If you have a non-compact web, you have to go into the spec. But here it is. After you, uh, after you plug in R sub PT here into here, you end up with just a plastic moment strength. Now that we've We've, we've kind of finished up with what we're going to talk about on the specification, but let's take a look at this uh, this, this reinforcement with a T at the bottom flange of the beam is, is, is used enough where uh, we're, we would like to be able to use the AIC spec for that, but it says explicitly in the specification that you can only use section F4 for I-shaped members. But we don't want to have to go through and, and you know, do all kinds of theoretical studies uh, every time we get a, a shape like this. So what I did is, is I did a theoretical study. And this equation, we did kind of everything pretty much defined in there except for this warping constant. But the main thing is this beta x. You know, it looks like an easy equation until you see what beta x is. And then you've got this uh, integral, which, uh, you know, uh, I'll analyze an integral about once every two years. You have to, I have to go back to my old calculus book to uh, remember how to do that stuff. So that's what I did for this. I calculated beta sub x for that cross section with the t at the bottom and compared it to the elastic buckling equation in the AISC specification section F4 to come up with a, a, a good design rule where all we have to do is go into the spec and uh, uh, use the spec equations instead of doing this integral every time. All right, here's what I came up with. I came up with uh, use H sub O exactly as it was de defined before. Uh, don't worry about uh, what's welded on the bottom flange down here. Uh, just define H sub O as the distance between the flange centroids of the original member, the non-reinforced member. Now, there's a caveat with that. It's, uh, it's going to be a little bit conservative to do that uh, in all the cases that I looked at. But I only looked at uh, uh, WT sizes down here that were equal to uh, a maximum of half of the wide plane shape. 
So in other words, if you have a W18 at 50 beam, the biggest WT I looked at was a WT9 at 25. Uh, and, and, and if you go beyond that, I did look at one or two cases, and I found out that if you go beyond that, the conservatism level increases with the size. So it's kind of up to you what to do if you run into something like this, which I'm thinking that you might have other problems if you want to do this type of reinforcement, but one problem I can add to that is that you really don't know what to define H sub O as if you have a giant WT on the bottom. So uh, it, it's kind of up to you. Just uh, make a make a call on that or do some comparisons or something like that if you have a big WT on the bottom. Okay, so let's move on to talking about partial length reinforcement. And we can have obstructions over here just like we did for columns. I've got a couple shown there for you, but really one of the best reasons to use partial length reinforcement is because you just don't need full length reinforcement. Uh, let's say that your, your moment here is going to be, actually this may be a bad example, it's not that much less at the theoretical cutoff point than the maximum moment, but let's say that it's small enough to where at the theoretical cutoff points at these locations that you no longer need reinforcement. So uh, you can just leave this part uh, bare and use that as a development length for your weld. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. But for now, let's uh, look at how to handle if you have partial length reinforcement uh, with lateral torsional buckling. And this is in a, a more than 40-year-old paper. You know, almost everything that I've shown you today is at least 20 years old, uh, and a lot of it's 40 or 50 years old, so uh, it's research that's been around for a while. Here's the equation. Now, this isn't exactly the way they had it. I just kind of put it this way so we can use it with the AISC spec. We've got a reduction factor on our C sub B of beta sub LTB, and we're calling that just C prime sub B, just to use with the spec. So beta sub LTB is this relatively simple equation, and it's all based, uh, at least this part, is based on the geometry D sub R over L, where D sub R is the setback on the reinforcement, and L is the length of the member. One thing about this is, uh, as far as I know, there's been no research on unequal setbacks. So this research assumed D sub R was the same at both ends of the beam. All right, now we have this moment ratio that we're going to have to deal with. That's probably going to be the hardest part of the calc, or, or definitely is. And what it is, uh, let's start off with M sub EO. That's the easy one. What that is, is that's the elastic lateral torsional buckling moment of the non-reinforced member. So you can go to section F2 or just use a theoretical, uh, the Timoshiko equation out of his book uh, to get an elastic lateral torsional buckling equation. Uh, to calculate M sub EO. So that one should be pretty simple because it's doubly symmetric. But M sub ER, that's the elastic lateral torsional buckling moment of the reinforced member assuming full length reinforcement. So just run the reinforcement all the way to the end, calculate the section properties, and you've got L, and go in either, there are really a couple of different ways you can do this. Either go into section F4, if it's a, a, a singly symmetric member of the AIC spec, or you can go in and calculate it using, for example, a theoretical equation like the one I had up there with the beta X, and uh, uh, calculate it that way. One uh, thing that I will mention is that, that there are cases where you can be unconservative. If you use the spec equation to calculate M sub ER, you should use the actual value, just in, for this one calculation, use the actual value of J, not J equals zero, for all values uh, of I sub Y C over I sub Y. So that's just in this one calc uh, for the ratio. And the reason is because uh, what you can do is you can reduce M sub ER. That's on the bottom of the equation. So you make the ratio bigger, and uh, you end up with a bigger L sub TB, um, beta LTB, than what you should really have. All right, so just remember that.
All right, these are this next three slides. Uh, the next two slides are uh, test results. And remember um, what I said earlier about anything bigger than one is conservative uh, over here. Take a look at that. And uh, this is designed with the, the um, step beam procedure that I, ju that I just showed you. So let's talk a little bit about uh, preload on beams. Now for, for beams that are braced on the compression planes, you really don't have to worry about the preload. And here's why. Uh, you usually end up over here in the plastic range. So let's say you have a preload of 50% of the yield stress and you add reinforcement. Theoretically, at least, it's going to be down here at zero load. And then you add load to the beam. You add a, a moment to the beam. Both of these are going to go up. but the original cross section is going to gain stress until it gets up to here, and then it's going to deform, and more than likely it'll stay on that yield plateau. Because this is uh, drawn way out of scale, really this should be a way uh, uh, higher. Uh, uh, this this should be shifted over really uh, on the curve, and then you'll you'll end up with the reinforcement maybe maybe is up here or is is here possibly, but either way, just so long as you don't have any stability or, or or rupture problems in your beam, then you, you'll, you'll be fine. All right, so I'm saying neglect preload if you have no lateral torsion buckling or local buckling problems. Now, what about for lateral? What about if, if you do have lateral torsion buckling that you need to account for uh, if the, the top flange is not fully braced? Um, basically. We're going to use the same concept of stabilizing reinforcement, but now we're going to use the 85% rule. We're going to define R sub T R. Remember, we defined R sub T as the radius of gyration of the compression flange plus one third of the web. R sub T R is going to be the same thing, but for the reinforced cross section, and R sub T O is going to be the radius of gyration of the compression flange plus one third of the web for the original cross section. So it's the same concept. It's a little harder to calculate because you've got this part to deal with. You're adding a third of the web to the area. But the good part is that I've never had to calculate this because it's all you can look at the cross sections and see if it's stabilizing reinforcement. All of these are. And it's and it's obvious by looking at the cross section. And uh, all of these are non-stabilizing reinforcement, assuming that this is the compression flange. You're not stabilizing that compression flange in any way. So let's see how we can handle um, if we have non-stabilizing reinforcement for lateral torsional buckling. All right, so we know we can neglect it if we have stabilizing reinforcement. So let's see what to do if we have non-stabilized. And here's the way I do it. Um, in the elastic range, it doesn't do anything. Uh, the, the, the initial preload doesn't do anything in the elastic range. And it doesn't do anything in the plastic range like we've already mentioned. So what we can do is replace S sub L. And this is straight out of the uh, equation F4-2 with F prime sub L. And I've defined F prime sub L as F sub L minus F sub BXI, which is defined over here as the moment, the preload moment in the beam divided by the section modulus in the beam. All right, so that's the initial stress in the beam at the time that you're going to add the reinforcement. And if you want to, just use C sub BI equals 1. is going to be conservative. But if you want to go in and do the calc, you can you can uh, calculate C sub B uh, as the C sub B for the initial preload in the beam at the time of reinforcement. That's going to be based on the moment diagram that's in the beam at the time of reinforcement. All right, so we've got three more slides on uh, experimental results that you can look at later, but uh, just notice that at least all these non-shaded parts are bigger than one, so it's conservative, and that one is not even reinforced. It was just kind of there for the one that's less than one is, is a non-reinforced beam.
just to kind of show us where we are with the uh, ratios there. Okay, so we're, we're uh, this, this is going to be the last topic that we talk about, and I, I believe I've got about five slides on welding issues. Uh, we're going to go through this really fast because I, I think uh, this is uh, pretty much based on uh, things that you went through in uh, engineering mechanics, sophomore level mechanics. Uh, it's changed around a little bit. If you remember BQ over IT, that was a shear stress for engineering mechanics. But now we're going to take the T out because we want to shear load uh, per unit length. So that V, VQ over IT, uh, take out the T and you've got shear load on these welds. And um, once you get that calculated, you're going to, of course, divide by two because that, 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 that's the total shear load that you're going to have divided, you know, uh, that you need to divide by uh, the welds. Now Q, the only thing in here we don't know, V sub R is just the shear load of the beam, and I sub R X is just the strong axis moment of inertia of the reinforced section. Really, the only thing we need to know is going to be Q, and that's going to get, uh, be calculated with the area of the plate down here. It's the area of the plate times Y, which is the distance from the centroid of the plate to the centroid of the built-up member. Uh, for columns, I put this in there just uh, for reference. Go to the reference list if you want to see what, how to calculate shear flow for columns. And don't forget, the shear flow we just calculated is, is within this range. It's within the main reinforcing range, but you need a development length uh, beyond the theoretical cutoff point. And what you're going to do there is calculate an anchor force. It's just going to be MQ over I. M sub RC is just the moment at the theoretical cutoff point that I've got defined at these two locations up here. All right, so we really don't have anything more to do here because we've got these two variables already calculated. Now what you would do is take that F sub A, that's a force that needs to be developed over this length D sub RP. And the reason there, there are really no, you can either put longitudinal welds on there uh, to develop it or you can just look, put the weld all the way around and put an end weld on that plate to, to calculate, make sure that you've got that F sub A calculated. Okay, and really the last thing that we need to talk about is, and, and I've already gone over it uh, fairly well in the beam section, but anytime you weld to a member with load on it, you know, the, the welding heat is going to spread through that member. It's not going to go too far in most cases unless you're welding uh, perpendicular to the stress, like I talked about when we were welding that stabilizer plate on the beam. But just be aware that this can be a problem. Uh, you don't want to uh, get too much uh, welding heat uh, and cause a, a column or a beam to fail. So I put this reference in there, and uh, you can take a look at that reference to see how to calculate the... Uh, uh, strength of a member welded with a preload uh, uh, built in, whether it's axial load or moment. They have uh, uh, some information in there. And I'll tell you the way I do it. I, I use this paper, along with a few other references, to come up with an effective width approach, where I, 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 I use the values uh, in this paper. And an effective width of, say, four inches, for example, may not be effective. So I just I, I delete that part off of the cross section and design uh, as if it's a singly symmetric member or a non-symmetric member uh, for that cross section with that chunk taken out. OK, Brent, I believe that uh, that does it for us. All right, thank you very much, Bo. And uh, I just want to. Uh, take just a second to say I apologize once again for the delay at the beginning. That was an unforeseen uh, difficulty with the technical side of things. So do apologize for that. I do want to address a few questions we have here, Bo. We've received several good questions, and I want to take a moment to address a few of those before we wrap up. Um, a lot of questions pertain to this topic. How do you address different yield strengths for materials, whether that be um, it's an older column, say it's uh, with FY equal to 36 KSI, and you're, you're reinforcing with 50 KSI plates, 
or vice versa, you've got a 50 KSI column that you're adding 36 KSI plates to for reinforcing. Uh, what, what, uh, what insight can you give us as to dealing with that sort of design? And, uh, and that's a really good question. You'll notice in the, the, uh, the example I did for the column that uh, both the plate and the column were 50 KSI. And uh, the reason I did that is, uh, is frankly, because I, I don't know how to account for it. Now, the way I do it is I assume that um, I, I, I take the lower yield stress is the way I do it. And we know that that's conservative. And I've looked, and um, I, I mean, I've gone back. You can see the extensive research that I've done on this, you know, going back 50 years and more even. And I can't find anything, any research out there that would allow any kind of uh, general design rule to be, to be made on different yield strings. Okay. Um, at the end of your uh, session, when you discussed uh, weld issues, let me go to slide 104. You did mention this, this reference for shear flow of columns. Uh, is that to say that it is a different calculation for columns versus beams? The, the VQ over I part is the same, uh, but the question is, is how do you calculate V? And if I remember right, this reference assumes an initial deformation in there and I can't remember if it if it adds in like a p delta type effect, the one minus p over p critical multiplier, or not. But it, it assumes a certain deflected shape, and um, and then it, it kind of um, basically it, it used that VQ over I equation uh, in a way that. Uh, I don't know if it explicitly gives you a V or not, but it uses the same equation to come up with a, a, a V that you can use with that equation. Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, I have calculated the, this before, and um, on most of the columns, if it's purely axial load and you're just worried about uh, buckling strength, um, usually a, a minimum size weld is going to do it. But uh, you know, you you still need to at least know uh, how to calculate it and and know the magnitudes. Okay. Um, next question: If you are uh, reinforcing a tension member, should preload be considered? Uh, that's one of the things that. Um, that uh, we really, being that we were only talking about beams and columns, uh, we didn't uh, cover. But uh, the answer is no. And and uh, there's some research done. I believe it was somewhere overseas. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was in England. Um, back at least, I'll, I'll say at least three decades ago, uh, that looked at uh, uh, tension members. And the answer is no for yielding or or rupture. Neither one of those require any uh, uh, have any requirements to consider preload. Okay. Do you have any recommendations for uh, software that would help calculate these reinforced section properties, or do you typically use a spreadsheet? No, for me, I use a spreadsheet, and um, I, I'll go ahead and give the the um, uh, Steel Tools the AIC. Uh, website still tools uh, a plug here because I, I know that there's some good software on there. Um, some of it is based on the old allowable stress approach, but what you can do, it, it, you know, if you want to use the the uh, 2010 AISC specification like we've done in this presentation, um, if there's not one out there already, you can uh, you can take one of the older spreadsheets and and convert it uh, based on the equations. Uh, that are in this presentation. Okay. There's one more question here. With a 
regards to the bracing of a top flange, would a concrete slab on top of a beam be considered stabilizing reinforcement? Well, uh, now I assume that we're talking about something that's attached uh, to the top flange, like with, with studs or something. But um, assuming that, really you don't need to even do the calculation because if we go back to uh, well, all the steps at the very beginning of, of the beam section, uh, remember we, we said that if the step number four here was if the compression flange is laterally, laterally braced, then we don't have to worry about steps five and six, uh, which uh, step five talks about the preload, and that's the only thing that you would need uh, to determine. The only reason that you would need to determine this, whether it's stabilizing or non-stabilizing reinforcement is if you had uh, uh, preload uh, with, with, uh, without the compression flange braced. Okay. Well, I think we better wrap things up. We, we do have several questions we were not able to get to, and um, we're going to work with Bo and the Solution Center to, to address those, and we'll get those answers out in the next week or so. Thank you again for holding tight at the beginning as we struggled through those uh, technical difficulties. Uh, thank you, Bo, for a great presentation. I want to make mention one more time the references that Bo has, uh, has put on various slides the full reference list is found at the end of your handouts on slide 109 and 110, as well as 111.